So you might have uh, heard this. This is kind of part from our uh, rightful bagging of Qantas. The second, um, the second theme that is emerging from the conference is that the future is coming, whether you like it or not, probably quicker than you think it is. What the hell are you going to do about it? Luckily, we've got the perfect person to tell you what to do or to give you some ideas. Michael McQueen, multi-award winning speaker, futurist, trend forecaster, best-selling author of nine books, uh, works with some of the biggest companies all around the world to help them navigate disruption and get through it in a successful way to turn challenge into opportunity. Uh, he's a regular commentator on TV and radio, uh, works all over the world, a fine person. I count him as not just a lookalike, a friend. Um, today, he will talk about the trends you that are coming, what you can do about them, how you can get prepared, bit of a focus on the metaverse and web 3.0, but whatever you're worrying about, he's going to make you feel better. No pressure, Michael. Please welcome Michael McQueen. Thank you so much, James, for that very generous introduction. We are a little bit of a lookalike, aren't we? But um, great to be able to spend a couple of minutes with you today and draw together some of the themes of what you've already heard, not just yesterday, but also today. Thank you to Bianca and Simone, wherever they are floating around, for the invitation to be able to spend a really short session with you. And before we start, can I see a really quick show of hands? Two questions I'd love to ask you. First question, how many of you here have ever endured a boring or irrelevant presentation at a conference before? Hands up if you've experienced that phenomenon, just out of curiosity. Almost all of you, pretty much unanimous. Okay, second question, be honest. Hands up if you were the one delivering that boring or irrelevant presentation at the time. Anyone brave enough? A few of you are. Okay, my commitment to you is the coming few minutes, we've got about 47 minutes, I'm reliably informed, by that clock. This is not going to be a time that is boring or irrelevant. It's going to be practical. It's going to be honest. Let's speak to directly to what you are facing in the sector, not just dance around themes, but it's going to be a bit of fun, because I think fun is often underrated at most sort of conferences and gatherings. So just to get our heads in the zone today to talk about the future and what's the next few years likely to hold, how do we gear up for that stuff, let's actually take a moment to pause and reflect on what we've all just gone through. I mean, it's hard to talk about the future without referencing the immediate past, particularly this last two and a half years of turbulence. So let's kick our time off with a bit of fun together today. I'm going to play a quick game with you called Finish This Sentence. Now, you'll need a piece of paper and a pen in a couple of moments. I know you've all got little notepads there placed very neatly on your tables. I'm going to put a sentence up on the screens behind me here, and in just a couple of moments, I'd love you to finish this sentence in, like, I don't know, like two or three words. My challenge to just try and keep the words you're about to use um, family friendly, like PG, okay? So give that a red hot go, okay? Here's the sentence I would love you to finish in just a couple of words on the piece of paper there in front of you. The COVID pandemic has been a, and then fill in the blanks. If you had to sum up the last, like, I don't know, two and a half years of your life in just a few words, again, try and keep it PG, how would you do that? So just drop those words down. Once you've got something written down, Turn to the person next to you, and I'm just going to give you 10 seconds to share with the person next to you, how did you finish the sentence up on the screen there behind me? 10 seconds, go for it. All right, five seconds to go. Five, four, three, <laughs> two, and one. Okay. Now, is anyone brave enough to share what they just had written down on their piece of paper? How did you finish the sentence? Yeah. A pain in the proverbial. A pain in the proverbial. Well done on being like PG. It like has been, hasn't it? A pain in the proverbial. Thank you. Yeah. How else would you finish this sentence? Who else is willing to share? What do you say? An exhausting roller coaster. An exhausting roller coaster. And a perfect analogy at Luna Park, isn't it? But like it has been. Like that sense of, in fact, I don't know if you pick up on this, the degree of change fatigue in a lot of teams right now. The moment you talk about change and transformation, even the word strategy is like, oh, are you serious? I'm, I'm done. I just need a moment for precedented times, like just to stop and have things that are sort of predictable, because it has been that, hasn't it? Thank you. What else? How else would you sum up the last two and a half years? Is anyone else willing to share what they had written down on their piece of paper? They're right at the back, yeah. It's been a game changer. I love that, because it has, hey? It's funny, by the way, when you hear people say really positive words, like I was in an event a few weeks back, and someone said, oh, it's just been a real blessing. 
I'm like, oh yes, um, evidently you did very little homeschooling over the last two and a half years because that wasn't much fun for those of us who did it. Now to me, the most compelling end to this sentence that I've come across over the last little while is from this guy here, Lauren Padelford, who put it well. He said, the COVID pandemic has acted like a time machine. What it did is it brought the 2030s forward to the 2020s. And I reckon that is so bang on. I mean, there are so many trends that people like me, I've been in this space for 18 years now, looking at where the world's heading from a technology and a demographic standpoint. Stuff that we thought was like 5, 10, 15 years away has materialized in the last two and a half years because of what we've all just gone, gone through. And in many ways, it's like the future has arrived ahead of schedule. And you think about how this has played out from a very practical perspective, from a technology standpoint alone. I mean, for instance, think of like our use of QR codes. I mean, pre-pandemic, I would not have used a QR code for, I reckon, six or seven, maybe eight years. It was a technology that wasn't new, but never really reached its potential until, of course, contact tracing meant we had to use these things like 673 times every single day, everywhere that we went. And this has recast the way now that brands are connecting with their customers, with their marketplace. In fact, case in point, check this out. Last year, a video streaming company in China created the world's first airborne QR code. Check out this puppy here. This is 1,500 drones flying in formation in the skies above Shanghai that formed a QR code. And this thing worked like a normal QR code. You could hold your phone up to the sky and what loaded was a marketing message for something they'd launched the day before. And all my advertising mates got all frothy and excited when they saw this, like, this is the next frontier of advertising, to which I'm like, I sort of hope it's not. Like, I'd love to think that the night sky doesn't become a billboard for the highest bidder, okay? But it gives you a sense of how this has changed. If they'd done this in 2019, most people would have, would have looked up and gone, what is that and what do we do with it? And yet the pandemic has changed this. Now, of course, from a technology standpoint to even more fundamental structural change in society, I mean, if I were to do a poll of what do you think are the biggest impacts of COVID and how it's changed the way we live and the way we work, I'm pretty sure the number one voted thing in the room would be just this acceleration of the move to remote and hybrid work, which, I mean, hey, we've been banging on about for well over a decade, but let's be honest, no organisation was really taking it very seriously until we had to. Now, I don't know what your experience of remote work has been like. I mean, for some of us, it's been this blissful, awesome experience of like working in your pajamas, not having to commute. I mean, how many of you, it was like well, yeah, remote work has been your jam? Who just loved remote work and like would love to keep doing it a whole stack more? A few of you, I love that. Then you got people for whom like it was a bit more like this. That was my wife and my experience, like right there, just the chaos of trying to do remote work and still run family and all the rest of it. Now, regardless of what your experience was though, the truth is for all of us, this was a steep learning curve. In fact, I love this next little video clip that highlights just how much of a learning curve this was. I'm guessing a stack of you will have seen this video clip. And if you have, if you're anything like me, I could watch this video hundreds of times. I love this little clip. If you haven't seen this next little video, I suspect you'll like it. This is a video of a lawyer in Texas who in the middle of lockdowns last year had to dial into a court case via Zoom, he'd never used Zoom before, okay, and didn't realize he had a filter turned on to his Zoom feed, okay, so let's have a quick look. I just love this moment, because we all had moments like this over the last two and a half years. Let's check it out. Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to uh, uh, take, take We're a trying look. to, we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, in the... it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's, I'm here live. It's not, I'm not a cat. I can, I can see that. <laughs> don't you love it? I mean, who would have ever thought the phrase, I'm not a cat, would become a trending hashtag in 2021, but like it does underscore just how, how much of a learning curve this has been. So the question now is, what comes next after such a hugely turbulent time and how do we make sure we're ready for this stuff? And I wanna look really quickly in our time together today, three of the things that I'm noticing clients that are gearing up well for a post-COVID world are doing differently right now. So if you have something to write some notes with, maybe grab it out because we'll move relatively quickly here. But the first key, if we're gonna gear up for what comes next after this very turbulent time is right now, we need to be focusing on tides and not waves. Now, I often use this as a metaphor to describe the type of trends 
you and I have got to be really dialing into if we're going to get geared up for the future, as opposed to the fads, and we've all seen those over the years, the fads that come and go. Because I often like, and like in fads of being like a, a wave at the beach. You think like a wave at the beach is loud and it's exciting, but it crashes ashore and then it retreats. It doesn't leave a permanent mark. And you've got, we've, we've got to be so careful not to get distracted by those, those wave-like fads and just jump at shadows all the time. But in contrast, you think about like a tide. A tide is silent. It is slower moving. It's, actually to, it's easy to miss the changing of the tides, not even notice it's happening if you don't know where to look. But over time, a changing tide will reshape the entire coastline. And so the challenge for all of us right now is rather than getting distracted by the fads, that's why I love the previous sessions this morning and what Scott just shared before the break, rather than getting distracted by the fads, what are those tidal trends that we need to be really focusing on so we're not caught off guard by the future? And I love the fact that throughout the whole conference, we've had a recurring theme looking at the influence and the impact of things like synthetic reality. And this is an overarching term for something you've heard a lot about over the last day and a half. This is augmented and virtual reality as an umbrella term. And it's interesting, when we look at what's happening in this space, this is one title trend that is going to touch all of our lives and certainly influence the way our consumers and clients want to engage with us, with the industry. And I want to delve into some of the stuff that you've heard a bit about, but go a little bit deeper and you've had the chance to go with other speakers over the last couple of days. Because if we just look at augmented reality for a moment, how rapidly that has sped up over the last little while. And just to be clear, augmented reality, unlike virtual reality, is where you hold something up to the world around you and things are superimposed over what you're seeing, as opposed to virtual reality, where you pop a set of head, uh, goggles on much like this and escape to another world entirely. We'll come back to that shortly. But if we just look at augmented reality as a concept and a technology, and of course, most of us woke up to the reality of this with Pokemon Go, a whole stack of years ago, or feels like a whole lot of years ago now, when a whole lot of people got you know, really excited about this as a way of engaging with a game and the world. What has been interesting, though, throughout the pandemic is how a whole lot of brands have used augmented reality because they needed to. Stores were closed. Our regular ways of engaging with customers in the marketplace were not open to us as brands and businesses, so augmented reality filled the gap. In fact, a couple of cool examples we've seen come to the fore in recent times. This one here I love. Jack Daniels released a, a piece of tech 18 months ago, allowing you to hold your phone over a bottle of Jack Daniels, and that bottle will come to life. And as you do this, you can actually do a tour of their facility in Lynchburg, Tennessee. You get a chance to meet Jack Daniel. And he'll tell you the story of the brand, the ethos, the heritage of the Jack Daniel brand. You get a chance to look at how they actually make the product. This is fundamentally re re recasting the way you engage with this entire product and brand using this sort of technology. Now, we saw three weeks ago another really interesting example of this over in the US, and that was the example of Walmart, who rolled out technology that was new to them, but that actually IKEA rolled out 14 months ago now, which allows you to hold your phone up to a room in your home and overlay pieces of furniture, for instance, in that space, and it shows the measurement, and then you can go and order straight away online. And IKEA and Walmart did this, and they started ramping this up when stores were forced to close because of lockdowns. But to me, the award for the most brilliant use of augmented reality we've seen over the last little while would have to be the example of L'Oreal. So L'Oreal, back in 2018, bought a piece of tech called Modiface, which was a genius move on their part, because Modiface allows you to hold your iPad or your phone up to your face in selfie mode and actually try on cosmetics without actually having to go into a physical store, which was brilliant, of course, when stores were forced to close during lockdowns. What's been interesting, though, is as stores have reopened, people are still using this technology to try the products because they don't want to have to use testers in store because of hygiene reasons, so they use the technology that enables this. Now, has anyone experienced this? Has anyone tried anything like this? Any, any of you in the room, just out of curiosity? Only a couple of you have. I'd be curious to see what your experience of this was. The, the, what the feedback I'm getting is it was incredibly effective as a technology. Now, to give you an idea of how big this has been for L'Oreal, pre-pandemic, only 13% of their sales came through digital channels. Because it was still a product that you had to taste, or not taste, I should say, try and smell it, get the feel of. And yet today, 24% of L'Oreal sales come through digital channels. Much of that being driven by augmented reality. But the biggest thing that's holding this back still is the hardware. The hardware issue of, do I have to hold my phone up to the world around me in order to engage with it? And a couple of things to keep a close eye on, but this time next year, certainly, in fact, the expectations by February, March next year, Apple, because they're dropping a whole lot of hints right now, will be releasing a set of glasses that they actually want to now, supersede all of your smartphones right now. 
They want your glasses to be the primary way you engage with the world around you. And so watch this space because, I mean, they're, they're very cagey right now about what they're developing, but augmented reality is where Apple are placing their big bet right now. But even still, glasses are clunky and awkward. The one I reckon that's going to be interesting to watch in terms of making augmented reality a whole lot more usable, and if you haven't seen this, jot this one down because I reckon this technology is probably some of the most mind-blowing stuff I've seen of late. It's a company called Mojo Vision, based over in California, first revealed this technology at CES back in 2020. And when they did, the media hype was extraordinary because people were amazed at this, even when it was just at a concept level. Who's heard of Mojo Vision before, out of curiosity? Only a couple of you have. If you haven't seen this, check it out online. I'll show you a video in a few moments of how this works. But Mojo Vision, and this is like something out of Mission Impossible. These are actually contact lenses with built-in displays that allow you to have information basically superimposed on your eyeball. And so they're doing a lot of stuff in the, in the sport arena right now. So if you're running or cycling or playing golf, it'll actually load your performance data and your heart rate and your progress as you're actually engaging in those sports. We're seeing some brilliant examples of this playing out right now as we speak. In fact, I want to show you a quick video of what's happening with Mojo Vision, because this is going to be the game changer over the next few years that makes augmented reality a whole lot more usable for a lot of us. Let's have a quick look up here on the screen. Imagine if we could replace our screens with something that informs without distraction. Could we see differently, more clearly? Could it help us find that invisible edge when we need it most? or allow us to connect in crucial moments, providing vital information in an instant. Introducing Mojo Lens, the world's first augmented reality smart contact lens. Mojo's invisible computing solution will be a platform that gives you everyday superpowers and an invisible edge throughout your day. But before it does any of that, it first has to be a great contact lens that improves your natural vision even when it's off. Mojo Lens built-in display will give you augmented reality wherever you look. From being able to see in the dark or low light situations, to augmenting your memory with instant information, showing you real time translations, or giving you a virtual teleprompter. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible stuff. Who'd love a set of these like immediately if you had the chance? I mean, isn't that cool? I, in fact, I love the idea of that for those awkward moments when you go out to lunch and there's someone you're like, I know them, I've met them, but I have no idea their name and your eyeball will tell you what their name is by just superimposing not just their name, but probably their LinkedIn background, their title, their role. And it starts to really change the way we engage with each other and with the world. So that's just what we're seeing happen with augmented reality. But where I wanted to spend a bit more time on in our time together today was looking at what you've heard, not just from Brett and from Katrina, but from a number of the speakers over the last couple of days. And that is the more immersive VR stuff we're seeing related to Web3 and the metaverse. And can I ask you to be super honest for a moment? How many of you before this conference, because I know you've heard a bit about it, but how many of you before this conference, if you were really honest, were like, I don't really get it, like what the metaverse is, how it works, what the whole deal is? Thanks for being honest, because I reckon a lot of us are in that space right now. I mean, honestly, the word metaverse wasn't even in the business lexicon until this time last year. That's how relatively new. It was a science fiction term before that, but this is how quickly it's become just a part of the business landscape. Of course, when Facebook rebranded to Meta in October last year, that's when a lot of us started to pay attention to this being something that probably needed to, we needed to keep an eye on. But to give you a sense of how quickly this has become a thing, and I know that Katrina touched on this yesterday, it's been staggering to me to watch what this has meant from a real estate and asset perspective. So we've seen $500 million spent on real estate in the metaverse over the last 10 months or so. And I mean, these, these are, are fake houses, basically, virtual houses in a virtual realm. And I, mean, I don't know how many of you find this whole thing, again, just a bit of a, a head spin. I certainly did when I first came across this. In fact, I'll give you some language so that you can use this next time you're at a social function to sound very learned about all this stuff. So in the metaverse, there are five or six main platforms, or if you want to think of them as, as suburbs, one of them is called Decentraland. So Decentraland, last year, there was a housing development release called Fantasy Islands. So Fantasy Islands, 100 islands that you could purchase Purchase your own virtual island in the metaverse for your avatar to live in, hopefully without the squatters. I heard about squatters yesterday. That's an emerging issue, isn't it? So you could buy like your own island with a jet ski, fake jet ski, all the rest of it. These cost $10,000 each to buy. They sold out within 24 hours. They're now reselling for, get this, $100,000 each. And I've got to tell you, this has just the faintest whiff of Ponzi scheme about it from my perspective, okay, as a layman in this space. But, I mean, this is becoming something we've really got to sort of pay attention to because we are seeing emerging asset classes that didn't exist even 12 months ago. And all those asset classes, and we'll come back to this theme shortly, will require 
transaction gateways and platforms to enable them. And we're seeing movements in this space already. Of course, we saw in February this year, JP Morgan opened the world's first bank branch in the metaverse. And if you're wondering, like, what does a bank branch in the metaverse look like? This is what it looks like. Randomly, there's a tiger that just like roams around the bank branch. I don't know why, but there's a lot of quirky stuff going on in this space right now. But it's interesting, like, up until February, I've got to be really candid. To me, I was like, the jury was still out. Is this whole metaverse thing a wave or a tide? Is this something we actually really need to focus on, or is it the latest tech-induced um, you know, fever dream that we've seen come out of Silicon Valley? Because I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of arguments for both sides here, even at this point. But to me, the decision in terms of my own mind and thinking about this was made when I came across some great commentary from a guy that, if you haven't heard of him, is well worth listening to in this space, a guy named Mark Witten. So Mark Witten um, used to head up Xbox for Microsoft. So he's lived and breathed this technology from a gaming perspective for longer than most people on the planet. And in February this year, here's some commentary I came across from Mark Witten. He said this, he said, the metaverse is going to be the biggest platform revolution ever, bigger than the impact of mobile devices and the internet. He said, every Fortune 1000 company is going to need to have a metaverse strategy as they look at the next few years. And when he said that, I thought, okay, I need to, I need to think again about this. I need to re really focus on what is this actually looking like. Now, we can look in the, from a consumer perspective in a few moments about what the metaverse is, is shaping up to be right now. But from an enterprise and functional perspective, there's probably some more compelling case studies we could look at right now. For instance, looking at like, what does a metaverse strategy actually look like in practice? So Hong Kong International Airport have developed what they're calling a digital twin of the airport in the metaverse. And we're going to see a couple more of these pop up in the next couple of months, because what this allows them to do as an organization is actually to monitor the flow of planes and passengers in a virtual environment to test how changing systems and processes will play out in the real world. And this has revolutionized the way that the airport is operating and is only enabled because of the use of some of this technology. Now, if you've had to line up for hours at airports of rec uh, recently, you might think, well, maybe Sydney Airport could benefit from doing the same, okay? But check this out here. We've seen another example of this, this use of the metaverse. Again, talking about how recent this language is, back in November last year when this article landed, it wasn't even called the metaverse, it was called the omniverse. We still hadn't figured out the language at that point. That's how quickly this has come along. So BMW have built essentially a metaverse replica of their own factories to test processes as they're bringing through new models and designs. Get this, their production planning time has been reduced by 31% because they can test this stuff virtually before they put it into the real world. And so, from a, again, from an enterprise perspective, this has huge opportunities in terms of streamlining and efficiency. But if we look at the consumer side, how do we engage with our customers? This is probably where the most focus is being given right now. And for good reason. I mean, in February this year, we saw McDonald's open the world's first metaverse fast food restaurant. So if you're in the metaverse roaming around with your headset on, you can walk in, order some McDonald's, it gets delivered to your real world address, the doorbell goes off, you take off your headset, maybe you go and have lunch. And so we're seeing examples like this. I was working with some car dealership CEOs yesterday and we're talking about what does a car dealership in the metaverse look like? And this is actually what it looks like. So Hyundai are first to the market here. They develop, developed a virtual car dealership where you actually go in and get a chance to test drive a car, look at different models while working in a, in a virtual environment. But one of the interesting examples I'm looking at in a retail space right now is Forever 21. So they've developed a metaverse retail storefront where you can actually go in and, and look at their entire product range, order products that then get delivered to your home. And what we'll see a number of these pop up over the next little while where we're heading next is not just using the metaverse to purchase products or engage with services that you'll benefit from in the real world, but, okay, and strap in, because this is where the head spin begins, okay, is what we're seeing is the development of a whole asset class of products. This is, really, this is the whole NFT discussion we've heard a lot about, these blockchain-based products that are only designed to be used in a virtual environment. And we've heard language like, you know, direct to consumer, we hear this sort of language a fair bit. This is, a term, this is some terminology you may not have heard yet, but watch this space, we'll hear a lot more about this over the next little while. What they call direct to avatar. These are products, like, and some of you are like, are you serious? But follow me here. These are products developed to be sold and used in a fully virtual environment by your avatar. And if you find this all a bit weird, 
Get your head around the fact that for Gen Z, this is not weird. They've spent a lot of real hard currency money on skins for their avatars in the gaming world for a whole lot of years now. This is not weird for them, but it's weird for many of us. Now, case in point around what does direct to avatar look like as an asset class? Check out this bag here that Gucci have produced. So this bag here, I don't know how many of you would like to purchase one of these just to have in the real world, but this bag actually retails for $3,400. Now, that's, of course, something that most of us would think is a silly sum to pay for a bag, but people do it all the time. So, that's the real Gucci bag. This bag was replicated to be able to sell for people to use on their avatar. So, rather than having the bag physically, you could actually just get a digital version of this bag, and that's what the avatar version of the bag looked like. Now, if you think about what's the value of a digital bag, value, of course, is always a function of expectation. How many of you would expect a digital version of a real product to be you know, it costs less than the real thing. How many, hands up, how, how, many, how many of you think it would cost less? Okay, most of us do. And logic would tell you it probably should. How many of you think it would cost about the same to buy a digital version of a real handbag? Okay, if you, how many think it sh it'll cost more to buy a digital version of a handbag? Okay, some of you may know this. This bag is now retailing, not a real bag, this is a bag just for your avatar to wear with pride as you wander around the metaverse, for $4,115 USD. And this is where we start to go, okay, what's the opportunity here in terms of the transactions and the payment platforms required to enable this sort of, I'll call it lunacy, because I'm getting old, and I just think this is all a bit mad, okay? But there is a whole generation for whom this stuff is not crazy. They're spending money on it right now. And while I think this will still be a little bit fringe for the next little while, this is not going to be a mainstream thing for the next little while, the question about, well, what does the metaverse look like? How mainstream does this, does this become? Well, look at some of the other brands that are moving into this space. So Nike, for instance, have rolled out an entire range of sneakers and, um, and apparel for the metaverse for people to use on their avatars. But what is going to be mainstream is the way we engage with this from a professional perspective. In fact, have a look at this prediction from Gartner earlier this year. Within a couple of years, by 2026, their expectation is a quarter of us in this room and in society, we'll spend about an hour every single day in the metaverse. And you might think, well, what's that hour going to be spent doing? Well, I, I'm, I'm just, my hunch is it's not going to be roaming around wearing your $4,000 Gucci handbag. It's just a guess as I look at the crowds. That I just don't think that's going to be the reality for most of us. How we're going to spend our time in the metaverse over the next few years is going to be driven by how we engage with our colleagues and with our teams in this space. There's a couple of platforms to watch that are really moving into this area right now. One is called Horizon Workrooms. This is Facebook or Meta's um, platform for metaverse interaction with teams. Another couple that are really, to, are really worth watching, one is called Arthur, A-R-T-H-U-R. A third one is Microsoft Mesh, which is going to overlay and work with Microsoft Teams. So if you're in an organization that uses Teams, Microsoft Mesh is probably the one that you're going to use um, from a professional perspective. But I want to show you how Microsoft, uh, how Horizon Workrooms functions. And my prediction is this, within 18 months, there'll be a good chunk of you that will have had the experience we're about to see dialing into a meeting with your colleagues, with your peers, or with your teams. Let's have a quick look up here on the screens. Check it out. Today, we are talking about Facebook's latest addition to its VR metaverse. Facebook this week unveiled Horizon Workrooms, a robust VR co-working platform bursting at the seams with game-changing features that could set the groundwork for a new generation of remote collaboration. The company's mixed reality office can accommodate everyone from smaller independent teams to larger groups using a suite of impressive abilities. Horizon Workrooms includes a variety of useful features, including mixed reality desk and keyboard tracking, video conferencing, wireless desktop streaming, hand tracking, and spatial audio, just to name a few. Upon logging into the press meeting, I found myself surrounded by other users tuning in from across the globe, each of whom brought to life via Facebook's new Oculus avatars. Interactions with others feels incredibly natural thanks to key improvements to character animations and lip syncing not to mention the excellent use of spatial audio. After just five minutes, I felt completely at home in Facebook's virtual meeting spaces. I say meeting spaces plural because Horizon Workrooms features several different rooms designed to meet a variety of needs. Whether you I mean, we could keep going, but I mean, you get the sense of just how this, this is like a Zoom call on steroids, okay? And what's interesting is I was chatting with Katrina Wallace, I don't know if she shared much of this yesterday, but I was chatting with her a few weeks ago and she was telling me for her weekly meetings with her teams, 
They're now done in Horizon workrooms. They pop on their headset, they jump into a room, and that's how they have their weekly check-in as a group. And this is, she said, it's amazing, within honestly about six minutes, you feel like you're chatting with your colleagues in the same physical room, far more so than if you're dialing into a traditional Zoom or Microsoft Teams call. Now, if you're wondering what's the appetite for this sort of stuff, I've got to tell you, it's higher than I initially thought. So some research that was done a couple of months ago um, asked Australian consumers how many of them would like to use the metaverse as a tool in the workplace. 34% said they're up for it. They're like, bring it on. And again, this is not theory. We saw earlier this year Accenture be one of the first major global companies to actually use the metaverse as their onboarding tool. So if you started work at Accenture, your first week or two wasn't interacting with people physically. It was actually putting on a headset from your own home and actually meeting in one of Accenture's virtual facilities to learn about the company and meet your peers, but in a virtual environment. Now, I understand if all of this does feel like just it's way out of the box, because for a lot of us it sort of is. I'm curious just to, if we press pause for a few moments, if you were to sum up in just a word how you feel about some of the trends and changes we just touched on very briefly there, what would that one word be? Maybe again, maybe let's use your piece of paper in front of you just to sort of make this something tangible. If you had to jot down in one word how you feel about this stuff, what would that word be and why? How do you feel about this, this whole area of change and why do you feel that way? I'm curious. So I'll give you maybe just 20 seconds to jot down on the piece of paper in front of you. How do you feel and why? And then feel free to share that with the person next to you. 20 seconds, go for it. Okay, five seconds to go, please. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right. I'd be so curious to see what like some of the content of those discussions has been. Just really quickly, anyone willing to share like what their one word would be and why? Like how would you describe your, your feeling about some of the stuff we've just talked about? Who's willing to share how they would their description of how they feel and why they feel that way? Who's brave enough? Just takes one person to keep things off. Just here, thank you, yeah. To be honest, I don't know why, but I find it fascinating. You find it fascinating, and it sort of is because it's bright and shiny and new. I mean, it's innately fascinating. And by the way, I should say, if I were to ask how you feel professionally versus personally, I wonder if the answer's different. Like, because professionally, I find this stuff really interesting. As a parent of a six-year-old, I find this utterly terrifying for a whole stack of reasons. In fact, if we have time at the end, we can go into some of that. But the, at the core of it is this sense of like, what is it like when you've got a generation coming through for whom the virtual world is more interesting than the real one? That to me is inherently a worry and we've got to be, but I should say this is already happening because as we said, they're playing Roblox. That's a metaverse based game. This is already underfoot and we, we need to be aware of that. But I think, yeah, certainly it is fascinating but I wonder how we feel personally versus professionally. Often there's a bit of a, a divide there, but thank you, I love that. So you're fascinated by this. Who else is willing to say how they feel and why? Yeah. I'll start uh, professionally, I think it's an opportunity. And, yep. and why? Because I feel like uh, the rate of change has picked up, the way we're working has changed, but yeah. the tools to make that effective haven't kept up. Yep. I look at that and I think it could be a part of the solution to yeah. some of the challenges we're currently having. Yep. On a personal note, the word that comes to mind is retirement. <laughs> It's just easy to bow out. I get it. I understand. I love that. Thank you. Anyone else willing to share how they feel about some of the stuff we've just gone unpacked and why maybe you feel that way? Who else is brave enough to share before we move on? Okay, we're going to get a microphone to you. I think we've got people dialing in remotely. Not in the metaverse, but they're dialing in anyway. So we'll use the microphone so they can hear you. So not my feeling about the whole subject, but at one point I kind of turned into my grandmother who used to say, a fool and his money is soon parted. Yeah. I mean, the discussion about like, where's the actual value in some of this stuff? Because of course, value is not just a function of expectation, but scarcity. And some of these asset classes, by their very nature in the metaverse, have infinite capacity for expansion. So I mean, metaverse real estate, for instance. And so, I mean, it's interesting you start to think about, we need to, to create value, we need to actually control and constrain the market for there to be any value over time. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting theme, I love that. Thank you, just one more, thank you, yeah. Uh, I'm concerned. Yep. Um, 
if the Gen Zs are tomorrow's leaders and decision makers, and they're used to a metaverse environment that suits their needs and their yep. wants and desires, they come out of that into the real world, and there's a disconnect. Yeah, yep, that's a really good insight. I think you're spot on. Um, in fact, one thing I'd just encourage you to just keep at the back of your mind as you hear about and read about the metaverse over the next little while, think about this the way you thought about the internet back in 1992. Okay, now for some of you, you weren't alive, and that's an uncomfortable notion in itself, okay, but if you were alive in 92, and like a grown-up working in the real world, in 92, the internet was clunky, and it was slow, and it's like, how does this thing really work? Is anyone going to make any money? Should we bother building a website? These were all the discussions in 1992. That's sort of where we're at right now with the metaverse. So bear in mind, this is still a technology in its infancy, but it is one to watch. Okay, let's keep going. If the first key, if we're going to gear up for the future, is to focus on those Tidal trends and not the waves, and one of the big tides, of course, is this whole discussion around the metaverse and synthetic reality. The second key to gearing up for the future is this. We need to dig the well before you get thirsty. What I mean by this is you and I and our organisations need to adapt to some of these changes before those changes become disruptions. And because this is, this is a challenging thing when, for many of us, we're in environments where we know our marketplace, we know the technology platforms, we know our clients and customers, we know the status quo, it's a known quantity, and it's working. So there's that sense of, hey, if it's not broken, don't try and fix it. And yet there are many cautionary tales from the last few decades where we've seen businesses that had a very stable, solid, lucrative marketplace that didn't move fast enough. And as disruption emerged, by the time it became an existential threat, it was too late. And they were then scrambling to catch up. And what I love watching over the years from a research perspective is brands and organisations that identified what was going to change and adapted before they were forced to do so. In fact, one of my favourite examples of this is of a brand that's you know, dug the well before it got thirsty consistently over the years is a brand connected with this product on the screen behind me here. Now, just shout out, anyone know this brand connected with a product behind me on the screen here? Corningware, well done. I often think, you know, when, I imagine when people say Pyrex, the Corning people would be so devastatingly sad, okay? But Corningware is the name of this company. So Corning, this year, 192 years old as a business. What's interesting about Corning is this. You rewind back to the beginning of last century, the vast bulk of their revenue came, came from making glass light globes. They were really good at it. They made a lot of money from the glass light globe business. But they realised in the early 1900s this was going to quickly become a commoditised product. As more, as more players came into the space, profit margins would be squeezed, and so they made a very courageous choice. And everyone thought they were mad at the time. They decided, even while business was still good, to move away from their reliance on glass light globes. That's when they went into things like the cook and kitchenware market. Now, most of us still think of corning today as the stuff in our kitchen cupboards at home. What you may not know is the vast bulk of their revenue today comes from things that have nothing to do with cook and kitchenware. In fact, it has, most of their most lucrative products weren't even invented 15 years ago. A couple of their key product ranges, fibre optic cables. Uh, most of your smartphones have Gorilla Glass as part of their screens. That is a Corning product. One of their big areas of focus right now is the medical device space. In fact, I was doing some work a little while back with Medtronic, the big medical device company, and they were telling me one of their products is this thing here. This is actually a capsule you swallow that goes throughout your, throughout your body, taking video footage of what's happening inside your body, which sounds horrifying, really. And it comes out the other end, I guess someone, I don't know, hoses it off, and they download the footage somehow. But they were telling me the tiny lenses in these capsules are actually made by Corning, using the same formula for making glass they've used for well over a century, but repurposed. Now, there is a message in this for all of us. If you look at the next couple of years, some of the very things that you've done for years will actually guide what you need to do next. What do you know? What do you own? What can you do as a business or a brand? This is not chucking out everything, but it's realising that as times change, you'll need to adapt how you apply some of those skills and assets and resources if you're going to stay relevant, and you've got to do it before you are forced to do so. I love this insight from Steve Jobs, probably one of his most famous quotes, and it's so bang on. He said, if you are not willing to cannibalise your own business, someone else will do it for you. And of course, we've seen this play out numerous times in the last few decades. If we had time, it'd be good to look at what this has looked like from a finance and a payments perspective, because we've seen this play out right now in this industry, and we've seen it happen in the last six or seven years. But this is such a timely and important message for all of us. Okay, number three. Third and final key, if we're going to gear up for a future that is uncertain and different and all the rest of it, third one is this. We need to be thinking progress and not precedent. What I mean by this is you and I need to be far more loyal to the future than the past. 
Now, this is a challenge, particularly when you're part of a business that's got a long and stable and proud track record. The challenge then for all of us, particularly for in that sort of organisation, is how do you make sure you use the past as a rudder to guide you rather than anchor that, that anchor that holds you back? And I'm guessing many of you be well familiar with this quote behind me on the screen here. Einstein was famous for saying that it's insane to do the same thing over and over again, expecting to get a different result. We know that. It's almost a cliche, really, these days. But can I put it to you? If Einstein was defining insanity today, in 2022, based on everything we've just gone through over the last two and a half years, how turbulent this time has been, I have a hunch he'd define insanity today the opposite way to what we see on the screens there behind me. I reckon he'd say, you know what, for any business or brand or organisation today, it is insane to be doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get the same result. Now, follow me here. What I mean by this is, if you're using the same technology, the same back-end systems, the same strategies and approaches you were using two years ago or five years ago, expect them to be as effective as they were two years or five years ago or even 12 months ago. Getting the same results as they did 12 months or two years or five years ago, you're going to be sorely mistaken. I mean, the pace of change means that we can never stand still for long. This is a challenge, of course, particularly in a sector where we invest so heavily in technology and we get it just right and then we bet it down because we want to get the return on the investment for what we've built. And in doing so, that's often where we start to lose our edge of relevance. Now, the truth, of course, is you and I love to do the same things over and over again. We love precedence. And there's a reason that as humans, we are called creatures of habit. We love habit. We love precedent. In fact, just to look really quickly at how endemic this can be for all of us, even just at an individual level, not just like a team or a brand level, I want to play another really quick game with you. Some of you will remember this game from school. Remember scissors, paper, rock at school? A um, bit of a refresher if it's been a bit of a while since you played this. So rock beats scissors, um, scissors beat paper, paper beat rock. Okay, so we're going to have a quick game of rock, paper, scissors here this afternoon or this morning. You're, so it's going to be the best of three rounds. So you need to firstly find a partner or an opponent for this game. So here's what I want you to do. Have a look around the table. Try and figure out who, just by the look of things, you reckon you're most likely to beat at rock, paper, scissors. All right, team up with them. Okay, pop your fists out in front of you. Ready for round number one, okay? Ready for round number one? Are you ready? And one, two, three. All right, round number two. And one, two, three. All right, round number three, decider. Ready? And one, two, three. All right. <laughs> Very good. Now, if you, if, you were the, um, if you were the winner just then in your little game, you're going to be the talker for the next few moments. Okay. Those of you who, um, well, hey, we'll do what happens with Gen Zs in schools. We won't say that you lost. You just came second. Okay. So if you came second just then, you're going to be the listeners, but listen super carefully because there will be a test. Okay. So if you just won that game, if you're the talker, Here's what I'd love you to do. Turn to the person you just beat in that game, and in 25 seconds, describe for them step by step in chronological order the process for you of getting in your car and driving to the end of your street at home. Every step you go through to get in your car and drive to the end of your street. 25 seconds, go for it. All right, five seconds to go. Five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, now, if you were the listener just then, I hope you were listening very carefully because here is your test. Okay, so if you were the listener just then, here's your test. In a few moments, I'm going to put up on the screens behind me here a series of nine steps. Have a look through this list of nine steps. Tell me if your partner missed at least one of these steps in their description just then. Hands up if your partner missed at least one of these steps. Who missed all nine of them? Anyone miss all nine of these? There's normally a few in every crowd. Now, I'm guessing most of you do most of those things every time you drive your car to the end of your street. The challenge is that is something you do so often, so unconsciously. When I ask you to make it conscious or explicit to describe it to someone sitting next to you, it's actually really hard to do. And it is exactly the same for us personally in our roles, but also for our teams and our businesses. And this is one of the biggest traps we've got to avoid if we're going to stay current and at the cutting edge as so many of these trends and changes roll out. How do we not get stuck doing things the way we've always done them? Because we're oblivious to the fact that that's just what we do. 
We do these things on autopilot. And some great examples I've seen of brands that have gone to great lengths to counteract that natural tendency for so many of us in our organizations. One of my favorite examples is Oricon. So Oricon, global design and engineering firm, a few years ago, they realized that they were sort of getting pretty stuck in the past, very tradition-bound. In fact, they were losing out as they were tendering for work to other design companies. And the feedback from clients was that they were just not innovative and creative enough as a company. And so to address this, the executive team put in place a new initiative. I love this. You probably enjoyed this too. It was a thing called the Dumb Things We Do campaign. And here's what they said to all their employees globally. They said, we'd love you to just share with us anonymously, what are the things that we do as a company that you think are just a little bit dumb, that don't make sense, that are no longer fit for purpose or relevant, they're not serving the needs of our clients as our clients currently are. Now, I don't think the leadership team were ready for what would come next. I mean, <laughs> it's like the floodgates opened, there were thousands of ideas that came back in. And the leadership team, by the way, this was a, this was a humbling process because some of the very things suggested as dumb things were things those leaders had put in place themselves eight years ago. And they had to be humble enough to go, maybe we need to rethink them. Now, they took this list of you know, thousands of things and they condensed it down to a top 100 list. And here's what they did next. They said to the business, thanks for engaging in this process. Here's our commitment to you. In 100 days, we will fix or get rid of every one of these 100 things and they did it. It's a massive undertaking. It was interesting, I was interviewing one of the exec team at Oricon a few months ago, who's now moved on to a different role, a guy named John McGuire. I said, what was the whole experience like? He said, it radically changed the company. He said, we talked about innovation for years, but because we suddenly gave people a mechanism for doing it, it shifted the culture almost overnight. And I put it to you, there's such value in actually engaging an entire organization to have this discussion around, okay, change is coming, what are we doing that isn't fit for the future? And crowdsourcing those ideas. But I'd also suggest the most valuable asset you've got for thinking progress and not precedent in any business right now is the person on a team who's got the freshest eyes. Might be someone who's only joined the business or come into the industry pretty recently. Because the beauty of people with fresh eyes is they don't know how it's always been done. They don't know what the precedent even is at this point. And they will have no trouble thinking outside the box. They don't even know what the box looks like at this stage. In fact, I love this student's exam response. It's a case in point of you know, the power of fresh eyes and seeing things that all the experts had missed. And uh, school teachers will tell you, this is not called fresh eyes, it's called smart ass, okay? But it does <laughs> somewhat make the point. I mean, this whole thing, like just seeing things everyone else has missed. And I came across a great example recently working with a group of local government leaders in Queensland of this very principle of the power of fresh eyes in, in changing the way things have been done to stay relevant as times and needs evolved. And I was chatting with this guy, it was during the lunch break at a conference in Brisbane, and he was the head of asset management for one of the big councils in Queensland. And he said they'd had this experience in the previous year where a, new, a young staff member had come into the team, part of the asset management group, and he noticed the way they were doing things, and he had a couple of questions. One of the things you notice is they had in their asset register a whole pile of items they'd been renting on monthly rental costs for years. In fact, he did some numbers on things in their asset register. There, was a there were a series of box trailers that they'd rented, paid monthly costs on to rent every year. They'd rented these things for, on average, 12 years. They'd spent about twenty-two dollars or $23,000 renting each trailer. They cost $5,500 to buy outright. And this young guy said, like, goes to his boss, like, What's, why? Why are we doing that? And so he started to dig a bit further. They found there was a whole fleet of pedestal fans that they were using in council facilities. On average, the average pedestal fan they spent $5,000 renting, they cost 160 bucks to buy from Bunnings. And so the guy I was chatting to, who was the head of the department, said it was a really confronting process to be like, it's a good question, but like this young punk coming in and challenging the way we do things. But he said, I realized it was a really important perspective. It took us a few months, but we went back to the drawing board and we completely changed our model. We went from a rental model to a buy and appreciate model and it is saving rate payers an absolute fortune. Now that innovation would not have occurred without someone with fresh eyes coming in, looking at the status quo and then having permission to ask why, to challenge that status quo. And if we look at this discussion about what does this mean for us as we gear up for the metaverse, and I love this example that we came across in preparation. I love this, it was one of the examples that we talked about on the call leading up to today. It was an example over in Italy where um, a bank over in Italy called Seller have actually released essentially a competition. You can pitch a project, it's got to be a metaverse-based project for the financial services sector. 
It's got to be ready to action within 10 months. The top five people who pitch a metaverse strategy, crowdsourcing ideas to make this thing a reality, will get 100,000 euros each. And this is a way of trying to, how do we get those fresh eyes perspectives to come into the industry and challenge the way we've always done things, giving them explicit permission and incentive to do so. And the last thought I'd love to leave you with before we finish things up is simply this notion that the power of fresh eyes is they see stuff differently. And I love the way Wayne Dyer put it. He said, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. And that's the power of people with fresh eyes coming into an industry or into a team and seeing things that otherwise we can so easily miss. All right, we are almost out of time. What I will do, though, before we finish up, I'll pop my details up on the screen. Look, feel free to check out the website, a whole pile of stuff up there that could be useful. There's a whole video channel on my site with just short clips that build on a few of the things we talked about today. And um, that QR code is for my LinkedIn profile. I know a number of you I'm already connected with on LinkedIn. If we're not connected yet, feel free to reach out and connect. Every morning at about 8.45-ish in the morning, I'll do a daily update. And it's whatever's come through overnight. So new trends, new data, anything that's just landed, just to sort of keep you on, on top of stuff as it happens in real time. So feel free to reach out on LinkedIn if that would be of help. And the last thing in case it would be useful, we had a book come out a couple of months ago drilling into this whole theme of what has COVID sped up. And we talked about just like one title trend today around the importance of, of synthetic reality and the metaverse. Um, in the book, there's actually 10 different ones. There's a whole chapter in there on cryptocurrencies, a whole lot of stuff in there around robotics and AI um, and machine learning. So I'd say of those 10, it's probably seven that would be super relevant for the space you're playing in. So if you want to get a copy of that, it's only a digital book, so it's not in stores, but it's online. Um, so wherever you get e-books from. One of the things we've arranged with the publishers is to allow people who are at events like this to actually get it at half what Kindle charge. So if that would be useful, um, that's the best way to get a copy of that. And I'll just say get a copy and share it with your colleagues. Like start this conversation about what is the next couple of years going to look like? How do we get ready for this stuff? Um, and that QR code will take you to the download page to get a copy of the book. So I'll just say, if that's useful, again, share it around. I hope that starts this conversation within your teams about what do we need to do to gear up for the stuff that's coming next. And um, a lot of stuff in there on the metaverse in case this has been a bit of a head spin um, this morning or this afternoon. But just as we wrap up, the last thought I'd love to leave you with today um, is a quote. And I love this particular quote. Because even though it's 2,600 years old, I reckon it is more relevant now than ever. And it's a quote from the great Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, who put it beautifully when he said this. He said, resisting change is a little bit like trying to hold your breath. Even if you are successful, um, it is not going to end well. Um, and that would be my simple encouragement to you. I get it that a lot of what we've talked about this today has been out of the box, a bit confronting, I understand that. We can't fight it. We can't ignore it. The question is how do we adapt and take, the, take advantage of this stuff. So again, thank you so much for the invite. Hope that was helpful. Enjoy the rest of your time. Cheers. Thank you, mate. Thank you, sir. Well done, good to see you. Michael McQueen, ladies and gentlemen, wasn't that good? And um, Einstein texted me, he agrees with the quote. So the, the change you made is fine. Um, the, um, what are you saying about the metaverse? See, it reminds me of discussions parents were having about iPads 20 years ago. Like my kids were just starting 20 years ago and all concerned parents were going, are iPads good or bad? Should I let my kid have an iPad? Should I? And it always seemed to me iPads aren't good or bad. It's just what you use them for. Like you can use them for a lot of really stupid stuff or you can use them for a lot of really educative and interesting stuff. And I think that's how we got to think of the metaverse. It's not good or bad, it just has things in it that can be really stupid and dumb, but maybe something you can still make money out of, and there'll be some stuff in it that's really useful and good and efficient. It's just a thing that's coming and we gotta work out the good bits and the bad bits and how we can exploit them all. 